it may well be that across the long arc that represents what is the history of this republic known as the United States of America, that there is no segment, Pastor Carter, or section along that long sweeping arc that is more blemished and more darkened than that period when this nation willfully, intentionally, and then by legislation and by action allowed men and women made in the image and likeness of God with the Imago Dei stamped on them to become less than human. Beginning in 1619, when the Dutch brought from the shores of our motherland the first slaves to this continent of North America. Indeed, to this very present moment, the sin of racism, bigotry, and prejudice has been a blot on the moral garment of this nation. From 1619 until 1863, when a tall, lanky, somewhat disheveled president by the name of Abraham Lincoln, who hailed from Springfield, Illinois, in the dark of those days of the Civil War, took quill in hand and signed a document now known as the Emancipation Proclamation. A proclamation, a document that, and we should be honest about it, did not do everything that was needed, but did enough to get us started. I know that there are historical revisionists who now revisit not only the document itself, but the motivation and the impetus behind what Mr. Lincoln did. It is a matter of record that President Lincoln said, if I could save the Union and free some of the slaves, I would do it. If I could save the Union and free all of the slaves, I would do that. Y'all are getting quiet on truth. And if I could save the Union and free none of the slaves, I would do that. It was the saving and the unifying of the Union that prompted Mr. Lincoln. But God works in mysterious ways. That even though his impetus and motivation was the salvation and the unifying of the union, God took that desire and baptized it in justice and mercy and made him sign a proclamation that declared that those held in states practicing slavery would as of January 1 be set free. We celebrate it. Our ancestors, our forebears, of whom we are today the progenitors of their faith. We celebrate it until that April night when Mr. Lincoln went to see my American cousin at the Ford Theater. And there, a demented, deranged man, and I would argue, but I'll be sitting in a moment, that America has always been crippled by the actions of demented and deranged people. Whether it is in 1863 or whether it's in 2018, it takes but one demented, deranged person to shoot up Tree of Life Synagogue. 
to shoot up a Kroger's in Louisville, to send bombs to elected officials. It only takes one deranged, demented person to come down an escalator and call Mexicans thugs and drug dealers. It takes one demented, deranged person to speak a vitriolic language that divides our nation. It only takes one and deranged individual. John Wilkes Booth, demented and deranged, shoots a bullet into the temple of Abraham Lincoln. And with his gasping, dying breath, the hopes and aspiration of those kissed by nature's son finds themselves shaken amid the volatile, violent moment of that action. Lincoln dies and is buried. And his vice president is a little diminutive man who's not just little in size, he's little in vision by the name of Andrew Johnson. He comes from Tennessee and he is as racist as they come. And he sets, are y'all still here? He sets in motion things that will undo what President Lincoln has put in place. And the arc of the history of our nation takes a turn for the worse as everything we got in emancipation and reconstruction is lost as the White Citizens Council, forerunner to the KKK, y'all getting quiet on me, begins to spread its fear and venom, not only throughout the South, but throughout the North. And I will say again, history has a strange way of repeating itself because we now see the grandsons and the granddaughters of the White Citizen Council and the KKK in these skinheads and these neo-Nazis who walk through Charlottesville talking about Jews will not replace us. We hear it in the language, in the words of Dr. King, of politicians who serve their constituencies, the stale bread and the spoiled meat of bigotry, hatred, and racism. We are seeing it played out all over again. We saw it with poll taxes and literacy tests when black men and women were not allowed to vote and made hard for them to vote. And I say again, history repeats itself. It's not poll taxes now, it's not literary tests, it's not asking how many jelly beans are in a jar, how many rocks are in a jar. Now it is they want to change the polling places. And now it is that they want to change the identification. And now it is that they want to change accessibility. And now it is that they want to narrow the times when we can vote prior to the election. And now it is they do not want students in college to be able to vote in the place where they go to school to get an education because history has a way of repeating it. And so we have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered out of a gloomy past. Till now we stand at last where Joyce Beatty is our congresswoman, where Michael Coleman was our longest serving mayor, and where Barack Hussein Obama was the first African American president of these United States. We have come a mighty long way, but we still got a mighty long way to go. But the same God that brought us in 1619, and the same God that took care of us in 1863, and the same God that took care of us in 1963 and 1968 is the same God that'll take care of us.